I'm Alan Doig. I used to be professor of public services management at Liverpool John Moores University and Teesside University. When it was at John Moores, I set up the first MA in fraud management with West Midlands Police and then extended it to other police forces and public and private sectors. I left Teesside in 2008 to go and work on a prevention of corruption project in Turkey for the European Union and then to Southeast Asia to work for UNODC on the UNCAC, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. I worked on a number of projects involving different countries and different aspects of legislation or investigations. I specialise in the organisation and management of anti-corruption agencies. I'm now partly retired and I currently work for SIPFA developing their uh, programmes on bribery, UK bribery. Corruption essentially is the use of your public office for private or partisan interests and a subset of that is bribery, that is a transactional offence. So corruption can cover fraud, it can cover misappropriation, it can cover conflict of interest, it can even in some countries uh, relate to unethical conduct. So it's a very broad term. Bribery is a very specific technical offence. It's a, a legal definition of a transactional relationship whereby somebody gives or tries to give or offers to give you something in return for you using the powers of your office or sorry powers of your office to the giver's advantage. It's important to legislate for the different types of criminal offences you're talking about. And when the Law Commission looked at the the existing legislation on bribery it was very specific. It's about this transaction relationship. It's not about fraud or misappropriation or any other types of offence. And I think if you're trying to address what you don't want public officials to do, you have to be very specific in legal terms what you do and don't want. Bribery has always been an issue. Um, and going back to the 19th century, court cases were making it plain that public officials were expected to have certain standards of conduct and behaviour and the courts were very keen they shouldn't be tempted to stray away from that in terms of their relationships with their customers, clients, contractors. So there has been since 1889 an attempt to legally define what you don't want public officials to do in terms of financial relationships or transactions with people with whom they have dealings. Organisations have to have a robust policy in place. They will have a general anti-corruption policy in place and procedures to deal with conflict of interest, fraud, misappropriation and so on. But I think you have to be specific, largely because, of course, it's quite often uh, very difficult to define what is a bribe, what is a gift, what is hospitality. And I think it's a continuum. There's not really cut-off points to say this stops being a gift and becomes a bribe. And the purpose of the policy is to make people aware of the risks they might face in terms of their relationships with uh, contractors, developers, customers, and so on, um, and to define what is acceptable, isn't acceptable in the eyes of the organization. There is a difference between public and private sectors, I think, and how they approach bribery. Uh, the private sector is very much focused on the legislation. You tell us what we can and cannot do, and we won't do it. At least we'll try and avoid not doing it. I think the public sector goes beyond that. It says there's a set of conducts that are not acceptable, leading up to uh, bribery itself. So there are probably much tighter rules on hospitality and on gifts across the public sector than there are in the private sector. I think the private sector is very much driven by what the law says you cannot, can, can and cannot do, the public sector is driven very much about what is acceptable and isn't acceptable in terms of official conduct. One of the problems with defining a bribe or understanding if you're, somebody's trying to bribe you is this continuum, I think, between hospitality, gifts and bribes. My view, and this is one of the reasons why the public sector has a different approach to, as may say, the private sector and why there are guidance, uh, guidance and policies uh, and procedures, is anything that's offered to you or somebody connected to you or offered to somebody for your benefit that might or might not relate to your work and certainly would relate to a customer or a client or contractor who has dealings with you or your department, that's a, that's a red flag area. Uh, and you need to understand that anything, whether they say it's hospitality or a gift or a bribe, in terms of the current legislation, can be a bribe. 
the, the legislation calls it an advantage and doesn't define that. And the legislation does not say, yes, we understand the difference between hospitality and a gift and a bribe. The legislation very much focuses on what type of obligation do you think you're under as a consequence of receiving something or being offered to receive something? And also, do you understand that you might be expected to do something on behalf of the giver or somebody related to the giver? That is all, whether you like it or not, uh, now covered by the legislation. There are a whole range of uh, circumstances whereby you might need to be concerned about whether or not a colleague or somebody working for you could be involved in, in bribery. It ranges from things like over close relationships with certain types of contractors or, or clients. It might be somebody is having dealings with them outside office hours. It might be excessive hospitality. It might be their lifestyle doesn't appear to reflect their salary or their position. It might be because they're simply in a very vulnerable or risk-related uh, risk post in terms of the decisions they might make and so on. How do you watch out for it? I think you have to simply understand there are means of monitoring relationships between the potential giver and the potential receiver. You can't assume everybody's guilty, but you have to assume there should be procedures and controls in place where the risk is uh, greater because of the nature of the relationship or the activity, planning, contracting, and so on. Uh, and you expect to keep an eye on that. You'd expect procedures to be in place whereby you could identify the vulnerable areas, hospitality, uh, after hours contacts, uh, and so on. You can't assume everybody's guilty, but there are a range of, of issues or red flags that you ought to be aware of yourself, as much as they ought to be aware of them, and be reporting to you if, of course, they felt there were areas of concern or relationships were being developed they felt uncomfortable with. Qualification is important because it, first of all, gives you awareness. You understand not only what the legislation says, but what the areas of risk are, but all, and also what the, the red flags might be. It makes you an intelligent customer if you receive a complaint or an allegation from somebody inside the organization saying they have concerns about this or have concerns about somebody else's behavior, so you know what you're looking for. Uh, and I think more importantly these days in terms of anything that might go to court, because the police are still very much interested in, in public sector bribery is how you then deal with the evidence, how you then deal with the information, how you then open the case file to begin the investigation. You need to be an intelligent customer of the legislation and the issues it raises before you can then proceed as an effective investigator. One of the interesting areas about, about bribery as opposed to say, corruption in its general sense is what type of activities are particularly prone and the most common one of course is contracting or procurement. The most famous case was the, the Poulsen case in the essentially began in the 1940s and ran right through into the late 1960s who was in a sense a, a, a developer. He, he was an architect but he was working on behalf of, of, of building companies looking for contracts in the in the public sector, but particularly in local government. And it is trying to find out what the, the, the council or the, 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 the public sector organization wants, trying to tailor his particular um, delivery, his particular contract to, to their particular needs and so on, and developing an over-familiar relationship with, with councils. In many cases, he was providing technical expertise that they lacked. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were overwhelmed by his ability to provide everything they wanted, but he was, in the end, was running the contracts for them. And I think that is, continues today to be a, a major area of concern. And there are lots of other cases around that time and, and, and today. Uh, suppliers to big organizations wanting to win and retain business. And the Act now covers retaining business as well as, well as um, winning business in the first place. But it involves everything, licenses, it involves um, jobs, it involves insider information, and so on. Any service or function that a public sector organization provides that has a benefit or cost to the, the external person, whether getting a license, getting permissions, winning contracts, it's all at risk. And I, if you ask me, are there any changes? No. Most of the bribery you see today uh, has been happening for the last 100 years or so. The existing legislation, uh, and by the way, that legislation is still extant uh, for cases before 
2010 or 2011, the enactment of the, the, the Bribery Act. All the past uh, the three bits of legislation, 1889, 1906, 1916, were all driven, about, were all driven by uh, contract bribery. Uh, and indeed, the legislation today is partly driven by that. The, the Poulsen era triggered off this wish to reform the law. Um, certainly, there are a number of scandals, particularly I involving Parliament, that uh, showed an interest in the need to reform the, the legislation. The legislation itself, the old legislation, needed updating and more bringing, making it more comprehensive. There are also external drivers. The, the British government, or successive governments, have signed various bits of international legislation conventions, which require the UK to revise its legislation, um, and in particular revise the extent that what's called the jurisdiction, I, where, where bribery can take place. There was a change in 2001 for this, but the 2010 Act uh, essentially brought this all together. And what it did was clear up the anomalies of the existing legislation. It widened the jurisdiction um, globally, so a bribe it takes place anywhere. It can be tried in UK courts. And in particular, it addressed the issue of private sector companies and their ability to demonstrate if they get involved with bribery, they had adequate procedures in place to try and prevent bribery happening in the first place. Now that's largely relating to the activities of British companies overseas, but of course the legislation makes that particular requirement applicable to the UK context. Uh, and that's unusual. Most, uh, most countries don't have that requirement on the private sector, but it makes it uh, very important now for the private sector to have its own policies and procedures in place in relation to bribery as well as the public sector.